grew up by it. Very That's a by the very tracks. good reason. Out at I, I would say, and uh, the train certainly uh, uh, went by that beautiful little station in Wayzata. That's and right. I'm so glad that it's being quite well preserved. It's become a museum. Yeah, that's for sure. Now let's cover the tender, please. Again, the tender, and this was exclusively oil. Never, re never used coal at all. And they uh, had an oil bunker, um, the same position as you saw on the earlier engine, and all the rest of the body underneath and behind was used for carrying water. Okay, now we were, we're going to now cover the R2. What's the difference here? Tremendous difference in size. If this is basically a freight engine, carried many, many tons of freight. Uh, as you can see, uh, this engine has a two-wheel lead truck for stability. It has eight drivers and then a set of cylinders and another eight drivers, 16 drive wheels in all, and a two-wheel trailing truck. In other words, a 2882. That's correct. And an interesting thing about this type of engine is that it actually is what we call articulated. At this point forward, the front engine could move out and, and to go over curves. You Otherwise, might, you couldn't you get it You might call it, it almost like hinged. Correct. Okay, how about the, uh, the tender? Identically the same thing as what we spoke of on this S1 that you just saw. It, again, is exclusively oil and with a tremendous uh, capacity for water. Mm -hmm. uh, Dick, we're not going to show any more locomotives in this section, but I'd like very much now to tell the folks that later in the show, we're going to ask that you write down a date because we're going to tell you about the free model railroad show that's at Harmar Mall. And you will be able to see many locomotives, uh, depots, uh, boxcars, passenger trains, what have you, all for free, put on by some 80 model railroaders who are proud to show their, their accomplishments. And we ask that you more or less get a pencil and paper out and write that down. So April 20, I should say February 25th, that's this month, we're going to tell you about that big railroad show on February 25. Anybody who enjoys airplanes can be a pilot. Just become a model plane hobbyist. Claude Newman at Woodcraft is a pioneer in the model plane industry. When Claude Newman talks, people listen. Okay, Claude? Spread your wings. Okay, and these are beginner's kits made out of balsa and paper. The old-fashioned kind, they're fun for youngsters and oldsters, too. Many in the series, starting with the Javelin, and next, the Piper, or I should say, the Cessna 180, and there we have the Piper Cub, and last but not least, this big aero flying model. These items, along with the proper paints and glues, do the job, and of course, even to the brushes. You'll find them, of course, at all the Woodcraft hobby stores, and we're out there to help you to do a better job. They make excellent gifts. Christmas is coming, and, of course, for birthdays and those special occasions also. That's today's high-flying tip about model planes, Jimmy. Since 1938, the Woodcraft hobby stores have served as hangers for the most model planes to be seen anywhere near here. Why don't you taxi in this afternoon or any day of the week? You'll find the people out at Woodcraft all revved up and ready to tell you anything you want to know about the hobby of model planes. Just fly over to the Woodcraft Super Hobby Store nearest you. Woodcraft has everything new, from ready-to-fly planes to kits for you to build your own plane to radio-controlled apparatus. At Woodcraft, everything is just for fun. The Dremel Motor Tool, an excellent year-round gift for a beginning or expert craftsman. For industrial use, it saws, it sands, it drills, it grinds, it sharpens, it polishes, it carves, it engraves, it cuts metals. Five complete sets from $34.95. Woodcraft carries the hundreds of accessories, cutters, and grinders. Woodcraft Hobby Stores, Harmar Mall, Roseville, Signal Hills, West St. Paul, and Lake Street in Bryant, Minneapolis. Well, Dick, uh, now we're going to cover some of these smaller switchers. How many classes were, uh, of engines uh, were there in, on the Great Northern? Literally from A to Z. No kidding. It just worked out that yes. way. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, you're going to show an A. Let's cover this little uh, so-called so gold-plated one. Why is it that way? Um, that's the way they come, many of them, from Japan because the, the gold is merely a protection over the brass. And the modelers, in many cases, either paint them themselves or they hire a painter, a professional painter to oh, do Okay, it. now, uh, uh, 
Al has a beautiful close-up on this. And well, how about the real arrangement on the A? The A is in what we call an 060 switcher. It has no lead truck and it has no trailing truck. It depends no trailing completely truck? on the drivers themselves, which is true of most switch engines in the yards. Why was that? Well, because they didn't, they weren't subject to going out at high speeds on the road where they needed the stability of a lead truck and a trailing truck. So they also, they could like work in the, the tight corners. That's correct. They had no encumbrances from the extra drivers. I remember a, a locomotive, it happened to be on Milwaukee, that uh, did the switching for Minneapolis Moline uh, over on uh, Lake Street near 27th, and mm -hmm. it was an 060. Very, uh, I think that this type of slant uh, tender was popular amongst many roads, was it? Uh, it was uh, quite a universal thing years back because it allowed the engineer and the fireman to look back over the top of the tender and also the, the switchman could climb up onto the tender. In the back Very good one. point. Now let's go forward and get the one that's painted in black. All right, that's a natural evolvement. That's an 080 that has another set of drivers. It's much heavier. Uh, where this engine came out shortly after the, around the turn of the century, the one you're looking at there was World War I and they lasted virtually to the end of the days of steam. It's more or less a heavy switcher then? That's correct, a very heavy Were they switcher. ever used in road service? No, never. They were strictly yard, but they were used uh, up in the ore docks to handle the tremendous uh, tonnage that you had up there. Very good. Let's go on now to the one that's painted in the green, uh, silver, and red. All right, Claude, that is uh, class 01 Mikado, or Mike, as it's called. It's a 282 wheel arrangement and uh, was used exclusively for freight, and it was, it was built to handle heavy tonnage. They came out, first ones, which you're looking at there, came out in 1911, and many of them lasted to the last days of steam. Uh, call, calling it the Mikado, I would assume then perhaps uh, Locomotives of this design were shipped over to Japan? The original 282s were shipped to Japan, and hence came the name Mikado, which we've shortened to Mike. Well, that's very good. And how about the caboose in behind? The caboose, this represents a little era, later era of the cabooses. Cabooses started in wood sheathing, like wood siding, vertical siding, and evolved into plywood and into steel side uh, Si steel construction, and this was a steel constructed caboose from the 40s. Okay, and now we'll cover last but not least in this segment. I think this is very interesting because this is a General Motors diesel model FT, which spelled the death knell for all of the steamers that you just saw here. It came out in 1940, and as soon as World War II was over, the Great Northern, as most roads, converted to this type of diesel power uh, uh, for everything as rapidly as they could. And uh, why was that uh, done? What was the uh, logic behind it? Far more efficient use of fuel. They used a fraction of the fuel. They didn't need all the water, the copious amounts of water that we used for steam. They could make them in any kind of combination when only one crew was needed to run as many diesels as you needed. Uh, this was the FT. Did that stand for freight, perhaps? Yes, it did. Uh, very good point. Uh, incidentally, similar diesels were uh, of this type were used also for passenger use. Absolutely, they yes, they were. Uh, I know they call those Fs, and there were series up through F9s, as a matter of fact. Uh, many of the interesting details that you're going to be able to check with the model railroaders at the big model railroad show on February 25th at Harma. We'll be back. No doubt about it, the great American pastime is not baseball, not football, but automobiles. Americans love their cars. New cars, classic cars, antique cars, sports cars, racing cars, and trucks, too. Now, let's meet Claude Newman at his automobile showroom. Hi, model cars are big business at Woodcraft Hobby Stores because we carry so many different kinds. Literally hundreds upon hundreds of them that carry price tags of under a dollar to $275. Want to see a $275 kit? Look at this beauty, a model of a Rolls-Royce Phantom II that you can buy and assemble right in your own home. Here's a kit for a small child or a beginner at under a dollar at Woodcraft Hobby. We have hundreds of model car kits at Woodcraft Hobby, formula cars, stock cars, dragsters, Indy 500 cars. We have lots of classic and antique cars, too. Rolls Royces, Duesenbergs, Bugattis, Lincoln Sport Phaetons, and trucks. 
do we have trucks at Woodcraft? Trucks of every imaginable shape, from livestock trucks to flatbeds and vans, and tank trucks and semis of all kinds. Just come in and shop at Woodcraft Hobby. Chances are, if it's been made into a model car kit, we'll have it for you at the Woodcraft Hobby stores, Minneapolis, Roseville, and West St. Paul. From diesels to electrics, Dick, would you cover the Y? The Y was used in the Cascade Division um, up until recent years uh, because of the Cascade Tunnel, and to keep uh, the, which is uh, seven or eight mi miles long. No kidding. That's right. It was a long tunnel, and the only way that uh, that they could handle freight without asphyxiating uh, and passengers, without asphyxiating people, was to use electric. It's as simple as that. And the electric power was picked up by a, 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 on a wire above on here. The that you're on the pantograph that you're pointing to. Mm -hmm. And you could put them down, too. See, I'm sure get the shakes today. How yeah. do you like that? Not bad at all. A beautiful model, and it pulled passenger, and it pulled freight. That's correct. We'll move that along. And, Dick, here are some um, early diesels. Right. These are Alcos. This is the uh, RS, or the S1 diesel, uh, used as a switch engine in the yards. And the uh, one that you see... Uh, in front of that is an RS, a road switcher. Could be used in the in the yards or out on the road. In other words, they uh, perhaps handle the short lines and uh, when they're out on the road. Uh, That's correct. Um, lines of perhaps 100 miles in length or less. That's correct. Uh, unique color scheme the uh, Great Northern had. Uh, you'll notice the greens are different and the oranges are different through the years. I suppose they experimented with different color schemes too. Yes, they did. This is true, Clyde. Uh, the, uh, we've shown you now General Motors. This is American Locomotive Company. Mm -hmm. Now, Dick, uh, we're going to move over into something of the, we might say, present day, and that's the big full dome. Tell us about it. Well, they call the Great Northern call those great domes. Uh, they were beautiful for going through the scenic areas out in the Cascades, and the people could sit in seats that were right underneath these glass windows and they could look out and see an absolutely unbelievable view uh, great popular. a great dome is really a, a um, proper nomenclature for it that's correct they were great and incidentally uh, just recently I read that the Amtrak has received the first of their double deckers which uh, are not dome cars but they are double deck giving somewhat the same uh, results Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Very Just interesting. Uh, Dick, uh, how mm -hmm. long were those cars approximately? Eighty feet. Eighty feet long. They mm -hmm. were a real long car and very, very comfortable car. Mm -hmm. Dick, let's us move now to uh, getting back to the old heavyweights, and I'm sure you can give us some details on that. Well, that's what they called an open-end observation. There's a little platform at the very end over here. We're going to move that slowly so Al can get that platform in focus. And would you tell us how that was used from time to time? Well, people back in the days before passenger trains were running at the tremendous speeds that they did in later years, back when they were 30, 40 miles an hour, people could go out and sit on that deck. There were chairs out there. And also, these were great uh, cars as far as the politicians were concerned. Presidents such as Truman and Eisenhower in later years used observation cars uh, to give their speeches from... I think that's a very good point. And uh, I, hailing from Golden Valley now, I have arranged to have the Golden Valley on the side of the car. Not and that bad. is, incidentally, the correct name for one of the heavyweights. It was a Golden Valley. Fantastic. Okay. What do we have here, Dick? On this car? Yes. This is called a refrigerator car or we, uh, a reefer. And uh, it was used basically to handle, uh, on the passenger trains, to handle perishables. The silk trains used them um, years ago in handling raw silk. They were used for apples when Natchez Valley and the apple it's trade was used. Cherries were hauled in them, many types of fruits and perishable goods. And they were hauled at express rate. And they were pulled, as I recall, right behind the engine. That's correct. I, I wonder why they did that. Have you any, any thoughts on that Yes, point? Uh, because trains had to be made up and, bri and broken up at various division points. And since this was separate from passenger, they could disconnect it without disrupting the passenger train. Okay, now let's get into the uh, Pullman a little bit more. I noticed that these have six-wheel trucks. Why six wheels? Two reasons. One, for weight distribution, and secondly, for comfort. It's, it made a much more comfortable ride on a big, heavy car than what the four-wheel truck. 
You know, my father was with the Milwaukee in the passenger service on the Hiawatha, and I'd, now that we're on um, the passenger cars, he told me that whenever you get into a train or a bus or a streetcar or any of these big cars, the most comfortable place is in the center of the car. That's correct. Not over the wheels. <laughs> so I, uh, I once rode on a Pennsylvania train, this was during World War II, and I got the seat right over the wheels, and it had the seat, as I recall it, had very uh, thick but hard cushioning, and I bounced just bounced, bounced all for this whole trip. It was, uh, well, after you, you got off the train, you were still bouncing, as a matter I of fact. I believe that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll go on to the next one. Okay, the diesel. All right, this is a, um, back to General Motors, and this was the F9, which was used on the Empire Builder after, uh, into the, in the 50s, and uh, was simply modern diesel passenger power. Could be used for freight, too, as well. Okay, Dick, now we see sometimes trains, pictures of trains that use diesels like these. These are pretty much a thing of the past. I, I don't believe the the uh, Burlington Northern, now the successor to the uh, Great Northern uh, Railway, uh, has any of these left? Do you? Uh, yes, they have some, but they're limited. They're, they've gone into bigger and better power. Oh, okay, but use. you'd see pictures with only one use. Then you'd see a, a B unit and maybe two B units, and sometimes five or four, six five, even. or six of them. Mm -hmm. Because one engineer and one fireman could handle as many engines as were needed to cover the tonnage. In other words, they tailored the amount of engines to the tonnage on the train. That's what killed the steam locomotive, and that's uh, what made the diesel. And we can certainly understand that we do have to operate as efficiently as possible because we, the public, pay the, the freight, as that's they say, correct. for bringing the freight it to us. It is a business. And it has to be considered that way. Dick, would you cover this great northern blue? Sure. That was called the Big Sky Blue theme, was used just before the merger of the of the three basic railroads. And uh, it was short-lived because the Burlington Northern, which formed from those three railroads, of course, uh, eliminated that particular trademark scheme. And it was, as you say, an interim color scheme, a rather interesting one to be sure. But let's stay on the caboose for just a little bit more. I'd like to point out sure. one thing. This is called a full vision or a, a wide vision caboose. You notice mm -hmm. that it kind of overhangs a little so that the crew can determine exactly what uh, uh, is going on, whether well, they have hot boxes or what have you. Now, we'll be back in just a very short time, but here's the word from Woodcraft. Well, hobbies and crafts can be fun for everyone in your family, young and old. Here's Claude Newman of Woodcraft Super Hobby Stores with a few reasons why. Great choice and low cost and great selection. Something for everyone in crafts, young and old. And we'd like now to show you the craft, paint, craft master paint by number, the string art, and the leather craft kits. And something new, the grandfather and wall clocks by Arrow. They are $11, and when they're finished, when you finish them yourself or someone you've given a gift to, they actually run. Great fun at Woodcraft. Whether you're looking for a great gift or just a satisfying hobby, crafts please and educate everyone. And the Woodcraft stores are super hobby craft stores. You'll find one in Roseville at Harmar Center, at Signal Hills in West St. Paul, and at Bryant and Lake, two blocks west of Lindale in Minneapolis. Well, Dick, back to another diesel, but this time a Baldwin. Right. They were uh, very uh, commonly used through the 40s and the 50s. And Baldwin built them. They were uh, had four-wheel trucks that were used generally in the yards. Uh, they were used occasionally on the road. Very, very nice color scheme. I think that uh, Great Northern with their orange and green is one of the color schemes that will certainly be remembered. But now we're going to come right up to the present. And Dick, will you cover the F-45? Well, the F-45, um, as you see, is painted in the Burlington Northern scheme, which is the merger of the of the Burlington Railroad, the Great Northern, and the Northern Pacific, and the uh, Spokane, Portland, and Seattle. Um, they were all owned basically by the same uh, shareholders, and uh, it made for a much more efficient and dynamic road. 
and uh, they are one of the leaders in one of the largest railroads in the country, and they headquarters right here in St. Paul. Also one of the most successful. Uh, they have fine people. I've had some dealings with them, and uh, they're top drawer people. Now, the F-45 is General Motors, and it uh, is actually a 4,500 horsepower locomotive. Uh, and uh, when they lash up, and that's the term that they use mm -hmm. when they put more than one, they can pull big coal trains and big unit trains and do a, a bang-up job of it. Now, I'd like to show you a book called Lines West, and uh, I'd like to call attention to the fact that uh, it is on the Great Northern Railway, and we'll kind of page in here, Dick, just a little bit, and if you, if I hope I find that on that introduction, there we are. I wanted you to cover these little emblems for just a little bit. Okay, um, these emblems started back, uh, the square emblem that we see up here, uh, and the one that follows it uh, go back to the turn of the century and the early part of the century. Then in the early 20s, uh, they introduced the, the uh, Great Northern Goat. They called him Old Bill back in those days, as you can see from here. Mm -hmm. Then it evolved later on. They were very, very uh, big for a long time on Sea America First, which was... Uh, Glacier Park. That's correct. It promoted America, though, as well. And uh, then they moved from there uh, into... Uh, still a goat facing forward and simply saying Great Northern. This prevailed uh, into the 30s and into the early 40s, and they overlap somewhat, uh, Claude. Here is a side view, a uh, side silhouette of old Bill, and uh, by this time maybe people remember the commercials with Rocky the Goat for the Empire Builder. Right. And then this was the short-lived but very, very attractive logo that was used just before the merger. That's on the blue cars. Mm -hmm. Well, this book, anyway, is just loaded with pictures. Unfortunately, we will not have an opportunity to get inside here and see them, but there's a lot of history in the Great Northern Railway and in its rolling stock. And uh, at the, uh, the uh, Big Harmar show, which we're going to tell you about in just a few seconds, you'll be able to chat with many people that are interested in Great Northern and, of course, the other roads that serve the Twin Cities and some of the what we call foreign roads like the Santa Fe, UP, etc. And uh, it's just uh, model railroad time, of course, is winter time. And this is why we have this big show coming. And now we'd like to have a commercial word on the show. Okay, now here we are in February 1979. Here's a calendar. I'd like to get a little bit of a close-up on this calendar, if we might. And you will see that we are at February 3rd, and that's way up here. And down here on the 25th, that's the Sunday, the 9th model, Annual Model Railroad Show will be held at the Harmar Shopping Center. We're now showing you a picture of the entry blank that you can pick up from any one of the three Woodcraft Hobby Stores, which tells about what's happening there. We wa don't want you to miss it, and it's going to be Sunday, February 25th, 1979, and the hours are noon to 5, 3,000 parking spaces, and we're going to feature model displays, kit building, diorama, railroad movies, and door prizes. Down on the bottom is your entry for the door prize. Now, these are available only at the three Woodcraft Hobby Stores. That's at Harmar in St. Paul on uh, North Snelling, at uh, Signal Hills in West St. Paul, up on Robert Street, and then, of course, at Lake Street and Bryant Avenue South. We recommend that you write that down, put that day down, because you can take the whole family. Its cost is absolutely free, and you can talk to modelers all the, during that day. Dick, we're planning on you being there. Oh, I'll be there. That's for Wouldn't sure. It. It's a great day, and we ha literally have thousands of people come out for this big show on February 25th. You want, we want you to be there. Well, so long, everyone, be, uh, from Woodcraft, and we suggest that you try a Woodcraft store soon. So long. That's it, folks, and thank you for joining us on the Woodcraft Hobby Show. You'll find the real thing at Westlake and Bryant Avenue South, Minneapolis and another Woodcraft Center at Harmar in Roseville, and a third big Woodcraft Super Hobby Store at Signal Hills in West St. Paul. Remember, you never pay for parking at a Woodcraft store. 
So shop happy, shop woodcraft. Join the fun every Tuesday evening at 6.30 when Channel 5 presents That's Hollywood. Enjoy scenes from your favorite movies, the best that Hollywood's produced, everything from the early silent films right up to the stunning Star Wars. All your favorite stars and the films that made them famous. And be prepared for some very unusual outtakes that you can't see in the theaters. Don't miss That's Hollywood every Tuesday at 6.30 right here on Channel 5. Punch Day's 1979 State High School Wrestling Tournament is underway at the St. Paul Civic Center. Some 550 wrestlers from around the state hit the mats this afternoon and tonight. And the fellow coming up here in the dark uniform is Dave Secure of Staples. Right there, you see him in the dark uniform, the defending Class A state champ at 132 pounds. If you're a Staples fan, I'm afraid we have some bad news for you tonight because Secure won this match in a pin over Jeff Erickson of Rosso, but he was injured. He had to default in the second round, and he is out of the tournament. Now, let's check some team standings. We do have results of Class AA team standings. Albert Lee advanced today, as did Kennedy, as they beat Worthington 31-14. to Other teams advancing, Fridley uh, beat Cambridge 28-19, and Anoka advanced in the tournament by a score of 24-19 over Moorhead. An interesting note from that Anoka-Moorhead match, by the way, there's a couple of wrestlers put long winning streaks, and I mean long, on the line. Steve Carr of Moorhead had 122 straight wins, and Robert Redman of Anoka had won 51 straight matches. They met this afternoon in team competition, and Carr won it by a score of 6-4. to four. They should meet again tomorrow night in individual competition, Ron, and that should be a great match. And that is a long streak, both of them. That's the news this Thursday, back tomorrow night. Good night. The preceding was a videotape recording of last night's 10 o'clock Eyewitness News. If you're a high school student and this 60 seconds looks exciting, imagine what it would be like to spend an entire week exploring the nation's capital from the inside out, meeting and questioning the people who are the government and those who observe or affect its operation. Better still, don't imagine it, experience it. Ask your principal about the Close-Up Program, or write us, Close-Up Foundation, Box 32341, Washington, D.C. Close-Up is nonpartisan and nonprofit. Close-up is an experience you'll never forget. Work and Mindy, a cute couple and a perfect match. Laverne and Shirley, another perfect match. Just like the perfect match of Channel 5 and ABC, perfect match brochures are now being delivered with details of Channel 5's new programs and with information about the perfect match contest. You can win big prizes as Channel 5 reveals the perfect match. ASTP-TV, St. Paul, Minneapolis, Channel 5.